Hi everyone and welcome to the Jim Croft podcast where I explore the intersection between the business and arts worlds. Intriguingly, my exploration of this topic began while pounding the icy streets of Berlin where I found myself drawn back to the world of Twitter, now of course known as X. Initially hesitant, I worried about the potential distraction from yet another social media platform. It was this uncertainty that propelled me to investigate how I could think outside the box, and that's when I discovered Hype Fury, a groundbreaking platform that empowers content creators in numerous ways, from content scheduling to inspiration to monetization. And so today, I feel really lucky to speak with Yannick Vase, Hype Fury's co founder. During our conversation, we'll explore a wide range of topics, from growing a personal brand or solo business on Twitter, to the benefits of scheduling content, and on to Hype Fury's expansion plans, acquisitions, and exciting future features. The appeal of X lies in its abundance of ideas, and few individuals understand its complexities, and indeed its algorithm, better than Yannick. Before we begin though, I'd like to say a special thank you to my new friends on Twitter, after an eight-year hiatus, I couldn't have imagined such a warm and welcoming group of individuals, and indeed, many of your questions feature here. Finally, if you enjoy this episode, please consider rating, reviewing, and sharing the podcast. I'm your host, Jim Croft, and if you're ready, let's dive in. And we're in! <laughs> hey, yeah. let's Yanni. go! Hey man, thank you so much for being up for this. You're welcome. You're so, welcome. So people Glad always ask me if I've got a personal connection with the people that I'm speaking with. So I'm going to say yes, we have a very deep personal connection, Yannick, in that deep, we have deep. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> at, le at least we've, we've come across each other once which was I always seem to be referencing KP because that's actually how I met you he's such a great introducer of people thank you for the support to come on here it's a pleasure being here really. thanks man so the audience who follow the podcast there's a lot of artists illustrators people who are working up sort of in the long tail if you like struggling their way through it and then on the other hand sort of solopreneurs all of this type of stuff but I thought that since people are coming from, let's say, the non-Twitter side, just to give them a little introduction about Hype Fury, about what you've built, just so we can kind of contextualize things, and then we'll dive into it a bit deeper. So basically, Hype Fury, you could say, is a suite for creators where you can create content and monetize your audience. That's basically the gist of it. And then we do a lot of autom automations. So for example, if you create a tweet, we can create a nice little screenshot out of that. And then you can cross post that to Instagram, for example, and cross stuff to Reels. It's just quite quite a few interesting automations also for people on, uh, on Instagram. Well, you can go so deeply into it. And I think one of the things that I should say straight up, and no, you haven't paid me to say this, is <laughs> that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be on Twitter if it wasn't for Hype Fury, because I try to have a degree of limitation with my social media. I'm pretty reconciled with my use of social media, but the idea of kind of going onto one more platform was just too much for me. And it, the, the, coming back to Twitter after sort of about five years or however long it was, and I, I'd kind of left it because there was a lot of sort of polarization and division, I should be a lot of documentaries and this type of stuff. And I kind of came back yep. and Hype Fury has just really sort of energized my approach because you can kind of futurize what you're doing that's exactly the reason we built hype fury you know in the beginning it was like a, a twitter only tool but we got so many people that ask you know can i just cross post my my stuff to to instagram to linkedin to wherever and so yeah we're adding more platforms you know? yeah i noticed that what are the analytics in terms of people that come to you directly for Instagram, because I know that there's quite a few sort of social media planning sites for Instagram and TikTok yeah. and the rest of it, but people associate Hype Fury much more to do with Twitter first. Yeah, that's true. I don't have the, the, the exact numbers, but I would say almost 100% will use it for, for Twitter only. And then uh, about 60% is also LinkedIn, and then another 20% could be overlapping, and then another 20, 30% is Instagram. That's really yeah. interesting. So, it's, and, and do, do you have a sort of thought to try and build out a little bit more into the Instagram and this, this type of side? Yes, Pr primarily for video, like the basic posting, cross posting, and just scheduling uh, posts on Instagram and Facebook. That works. And we're mm -hmm. now moving towards more video. So, that's planned. 
I think it's on Instagram, people tend to, or at least on the artist side, tend to sort of focus on minimizing their output a little bit in terms of probably you know, a few stories a day, but mainly sort of, it might be a post or a reel per day, but it's a kind of different approach on Twitter, isn't it? So how do you describe the approach on Twitter just for people who are on the fence or don't really get Twitter who are coming more from the Instagram world? I think most people on Twitter, they tweet between three and five times a day, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, like mostly text-based. Yeah? Probably, you know, 80% of the tweets out there are mm -hmm. just text only. And then probably the, the, maybe even the better tweets uh, do contain images or videos. And right now, I think it's, it's a great time for um, artists to go to X twitter mm -hmm. uh because you know the, the the amount of video views have have doubled over the past uh, year and and elon's really prioritizing video over other content you can see that in the algorithm so yeah. that's that's interesting i was wondering about that because something a sort of preconception i think that people have of twitter and this was so x so forgive me i'm going to be just getting this wrong all night so. <laughs> but I, I still got it wrong so. <laughs> But the thing is, is no people reason. sort of associate because people are posting so much on it. If you're not a sort of native to Twitter, if you like, you can kind of associate it as, oh, there's just so much gunk. And it's basically this kind of sense of the human condition sort of exporting or like an exorcism dumping its brain out online. And that turns a lot of people off. What I found, and, and this really surprised me, and I, I didn't quite get it, was just if you start working on Twitter and how to use it and you get you sort of get more savvy with your approach of A, how you use it and with who you follow and who you choose to engage with. It's just this sort of extraordinary phenomenon of ideas. And that's sort of very, very inspiring on the one hand, if completely overwhelming on the other for me that's true you know you can get sucked in deep more, more than in instagram it's just yeah. it's more superficial it's just scrolling through mostly pictures so it's it's a lot more superficial and on twitter you can really you know can get sucked in and that's also mm -hmm. like we've been um, dissecting the algorithm and what we've also seen is that you know you just get you get placed in certain you know literal circles of things you enjoy mm -hmm. and so the political thing uh, you spoke about, Jim, is yeah, it's it's mostly because you probably just you know engage with those accounts. You might not have agreed with them, you might have hated what they wrote, but somehow you clicked on them, and maybe you know, th th and actually you taught the algorithm, uh, you know, show Jim more political BS. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that that's so interesting. At a certain point in your life, you just want to sort of get into those sort of fights and that engagement and get involved with it. And, th and then at some point, yeah. you realize, I have a certain amount of energy in the day and there is yeah. zero to Why come. am I here? <laughs> well, it's just zero to be had from fighting people online. I mean, nothing ever <laughs> changed from a fight online. But it's interesting what you said about this sort of superficial thing, let's say, on Instagram, because I don't think that's entirely the case. I think there is also a depth to Instagram. And I think part of the depth of the Instagram is that people are more concentrated on trying to create that sort of one higher quality post. I'm talking at least within the arts. I can't talk about the general population or whatever. And I think on the other hand, people find that there's, even though you can get to these ideas on Twitter, there's so much on there that you, you can get completely overwhelmed. And I still struggle with that, Yannick, in that I like to go on Twitter, but then I'm, sun you know, I like to write, I like to read books, right? I like to listen to Audible. I enjoy podcasts, but I mean, I'm, a, I'm old fashioned, if you like, I'm a long, I'm a long form type of guy. And I go onto Twitter and even though I'm really enjoying, especially my sort of like new friends that I've made in the last few months. It's quite interesting what you said about the algorithm starts pivoting because it sort of notices more what you're doing. And I have so much more engagement from the sort of couple of hundred new friends that I've made in the last few months since returning than the sort of 2000 from the er earlier sector. Yeah. But I yeah. still yeah. find it overwhelming. And so how on earth do you deal with that? I mean, I'm not, not talking about the company side. I'm talking about you just being so deep that your whole world is within that. Because obviously you're so connected connected to that and i'm just wondering because i'd be like man i would find that exhilarating but exhausting <laughs> yeah well I, I i don't have a timer set for my twitter use but i still have a, have a company to run so i'm you mm -hmm. know i do spend i would say at least an hour every day on twitter mm -hmm. maybe sometimes two but you know i try mm -hmm. to limit it and i i know like and that's i think important for everybody is you know you need to have like a 
producer mindset, not a consumer mindset, but just uh -huh. a producer mindset. You can mm -hmm. scroll all day on, on Instagram yeah. and Twitter, yeah. but you have to, uh, well, that's at least how I use Twitter. It's more of a way of, you know, getting me ideas. Oh, this is an mm -hmm. interesting post. Ah, what can mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, what can I bring to the table here? And and that's that's the way I look at Twitter or, or any mm. social platform. Really. So you make a very clear distinction between the side of Twitter that is actually for your personal use and engaging and giving value and all the ways that you use it and the company side, do you? Are you kind of quite clear in your mind between the distinction? No, I'm not. Like <laughs> uh, Sometimes I do a lot of shit posting. Sometimes I don't. It's... it's <laughs> It, it's all uh, it's also based on my mood but like i know mm. like i have i have friends on twitter but mostly mostly they're people that are in my circle because mm. high fury because it's, it's just a mutual connection mm -hmm. they, they, they're building an audience or they yeah. are you know into twitter growth or yeah. but you're always giving value i find in your content like i don't like you say sort of, sort of shit posting or whatever but i don't really come across that on your feed is is, no, is it's fu funny enough i've i've did that i did that a little bit last week and it actually it, it works so mostly i i do a little mm -hmm. bit of shit posting in replies yeah but not like on my timeline but i'm yeah. gonna do that more because yeah it, it's it's I, I i tweeted about it said well if you tweet if you do more humor like half of the people won't understand you're actually you know just <laughs> telling a joke and yeah. they'll be still they'll, they'll i actually uh, said like I've been sober now for six days. What drink should I uh, have to celebrate? And people <laughs> thought I was serious. But I wasn't serious. I was just, it was just a joke. But like oh, a lot great. of people say, yeah, I should this or that. And, uh, well, I'm in some Germany. Said water, uh, some yeah, said water. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm in Germany. So I'd say a Hefeweizen and get off that wagon for yeah, one yeah, night. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating, this side of things, because having sort of gone back on Twitter, I, I kind of got really interested in my sort of personal life, I've been, I wouldn't say pivoting, but I'm trying to, I've come much more from the art side as a musician and a filmmaker, documentary. I've sort of always been on this sort of mad juggle. And I sort of came back onto the Twitter side. And really the thing that sort of brought me back to Twitter was that I wanted to, to start learning more on the business side. And especially coming from this perspective of, okay, as an artist, the reality is that most artists live in the sort of long tail if you like where they are they've built a lovely little business and they're doing great work but it's only very few artists that actually elevate into those sort of stratospheres if you like so yeah. kind of in going over yeah onto twitter it was very much a, a research thing for me and and i came across sort of amazing people who are putting out wonderful and very valuable content and then it was almost since the sort of start of the year, and I was sort of using it passively last year. And then since, since this year, I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know what your perspective on this, but very much this year, I sort of feel like you get a lot of sort of human botting going on now that chat GPT has come along. And there's a, a lot of writing that on the one hand, or maybe a year ago, you might have thought, oh, that's interesting. And that's putting this thing, but there's kind of a flood of pseudo ghost writing, if you like. And, and then some people doing absolutely amazing. I follow a guy called, he's a friend of mine called Kai on Twitter. And, and he just stands out. And the reason that he stands out is just for exactly the same thing that you're talking about in that he's not afraid to be himself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have this generic cast. And I just find that's very interesting about how one reacts to it. But, but what's your sense of it? Have you noticed a sort of different type of migration in your circles in the writing or whatever since AI has come in? How, how do you see it? Yeah, yeah, both both good and bad. I think like I, I've seen flooding of, of AI comments like uh -huh. literally, it's just really bad. Uh -huh. But I've also seen people reuse ChatGPT and, and other tools in, in a great way yes, know, to help right. their writing. So, Absolutely. You know, and, and I think for, for beginner creators, it's it's both like a good thing and a bad thing. Um, yeah. You need a life to, to talk about things on, on Twitter or on, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so they use it to, you know, help them get ideas out help them right mm -hmm. but there's there's going to be a point in time where chat gpt won't be able to help you anymore yeah i just need to you know because we we don't talk to robots we talk to people you need to, <laughs> right you know show personality and and show what you're up to instead of just regurgitating mm -hmm. you know ai so what's the sweet spot do you think for people on twitter at the moment because that's very interesting that you're sort of gravitating towards what you call chip posting but i 
interpret as more Yannick being Yannick, if you like, rather than just just giving value, which is a wonderful thing. But do you think that's the kind of sweet spot in terms of what people are asking or wanting or reacting to and indeed what the sort of algorithm is reacting to? Let's say someone's coming over onto Twitter from Instagram, they're right, we're going to dive into this and get involved. What would be your advice if there was someone who's not just doing it for fun to do stuff, but they actually want to grow a business or a personal brand or whatever it is they're working on? Yeah, so, you know, I I would use AI to help you write, but I wouldn't constantly use it. And there are people that only like literally copy and paste Mm -hmm. uh, ChatGPT. And that just doesn't work as well as just living a life and, mm-hmm. and, and showing personality and being mm-hmm. a bit provocative. It, it's, I think that's one, it, it, you know, you'll learn more by being yourself and finding your own voice. You know, th- that's why I think you, you, could, you can start with you were using uh, tools like that because it helps mm-hmm. you to at least start posting. A lot of people just mm-hmm. have, they don't, they don't, they don't want to post. They, they, they feel, what, what's that? Imposter syndrome. They have imposter syndrome. They yeah. don't want to post. They think people won't like this. What mm-hmm. am I talking about? I know nothing. And so it's a, I think it's a great help to get you yeah. started. But once you're started, I think, you know, you should really try and find your voice as quickly as possible. Just mm-hmm. experiment with, with things and, and, and yeah, do more of what re- resonates with others. I think it's interesting because I think someone like Justin Welsh, who was one of the people who attracted me to Twitter and then following him. And he's obviously got this very, I know you did a, 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 an interview together and he has this sort of very structured approach and he's always giving wonderful value, a great educator, a great teacher and followed and loved by many. And there's someone like Justin, I can see that he's also doing actually more personal pictures and this type of thing. So I think it's funny. I yeah. see certain people kind of pivoting more onto that. So, but anyway, in terms of why do you recommend solopreneurs and artists to get organized about scheduling content? The reason I sort of ask this is because to a lot of artists, if they're working on Instagram and they're showing their work, the idea of scheduling stuff into the future is like anathema to them. They like to shoot. Yeah, they like to shoot from the hip and they like to do it. And I understand the reasons of spontaneity, but then simultaneously, they're kind of not reconciled 100% with the use of social media in their lives. But I've noticed in myself, one of the things that brought me to Hype Fury is that, well, if I'm always shooting from the hip, as soon as I'm getting into deep work and really diving into a project, suddenly I'm three weeks off social media and that's not helpful from the other perspective. So I'm just wondering, how would you advise or, 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 yeah, just some sort of guidance or advice to artists or solo, solopreneurs about the reasons to start scheduling and to get more organized with their distribution on social media? You know, I think even great artists um, aren't always able to just sit down and be creative. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know who it was, but like it takes 30 minutes for all the garbage to come out whether it's out of your hands or out of your mouth. And then after that 30 minutes, you start to really, you know, you know your singing starts to be improved, your, 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 uh, your notes start to improve. Uh, hey, hold it on. just takes a little it, bit of time. It took, it, I've been trying that for 30 years and there's no damn improvement on the singing yet, Yannick. So don't Still read. not. Damn, <laughs> I damn. don't believe what okay. you read in the papers. I'm generalizing too much. <laughs> no. Um, but but it, but in but in general, I think it's it's really hard to just snap your finger and be creative. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not saying you shouldn't shoot from the hip and mm-hmm. just when when something you know comes in your head, you should post about it. You should. But a lot of people, as you said, they could literally dive into a project for three weeks mm-hmm. and won't be anywhere. And what I do is Sunday evening when my kids are in bed, mm-hmm. I sit down and I write my post for the week. Mm-hmm. And it might take me a little bit before I really start to be- become creative. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I first use Hype Fury's um, uh, inspiration section. So there mm-hmm. are like all these handpicked tweets. Mm-hmm. I scroll through them and, and that gets me into the flow. And then I have almost 200 drafts. And then literally within an hour or two, I, I've, I've got my entire week scheduled. Mm-hmm. And by just sitting down and uh, you know being a producer, Right. It's way easier for me to, you know, do everything mm-hmm. in, in one sitting for two hours, do the entire week. And then if I have yeah. stuff during the week, if I'm creative during the week, if something, you know, if I have an epiphany, I uh, tweet about it as well. But, you know, it's, um, yeah. So that's a sort of like routine, a ritualized part of your week, Sunday night. How long do you do it for? Yeah, usually uh, an hour, not even. 
Yeah. So this is one of my. But it's also uh, maybe yeah to, to add to that. It's also because during the week I just I keep notes. I add things to my drafts, mm-hmm. and that makes it a lot easier for me to then on Sunday sit down because I already have like half the stuff I want mm-hmm. to talk about, and then it's just so much easier. Yeah, this. I mean, this is the paradox is that I and I think this is something interesting for artists to understand, because on the one hand, they're looking at organizing their content into the future as kind of sometimes unspontaneous or or just it doesn't feel authentic for whatever reason. And and I can understand that because I came from that sort of mentality partly because I was, I was so unreconciled about social media at all. And one of the things I found since using Hype Fury is similar to you, I now treat it as a part of my sort of deep work, if you like. So that rather than, like you said, about rather than shooting from the hip and write good stuff there, but as you say, you're not always feeling it. But if I really spend the time to do an hour or a couple of hours and go into it, it becomes a creative entity in itself. And something that I really enjoy is that it focuses my mind on what is it that I really want to say when you're shooting from the hip you get wonderful stuff coming in and you're reacting to life and it's quite magazine style but when you sit down for a couple of hours it's like writing an essay and you suddenly it's like bang and then you're on you've got your cue and I love the fact that once you've cued something you're straight on to the next one so it's like wow it's almost like writing an essay in real time so I think that's a sort of misunderstood thing about scheduling that it can actually be if you give it the time it can be a sort of artistic time itself yeah, yeah, true, true. And and a lot of people th- still think like um, scheduled posts get less engagement or less impressions. That's that's definitely not true. You know, like the the, the biggest creators, they all schedule their stuff. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. Because they have a busy life, they have a routine, and that's what what's working for them. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I really enjoyed when I started Hype Fury and I signed up to everything. Oh, you'll like this, Yannick. I actually, I bought the LinkedIn plugin by mistake. I was literally, I was messing around with it and I pressed the button and it suddenly went through. I was like, oh, damn. So I'm now back on LinkedIn as well. So you're, you're completely sort of uh, changing my whole online approach. Um, very good, but, very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this better damn well go viral to get it, you know, to get it back. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I really enjoyed, um, so I just, like, I want to talk about sort of lead magnets for a second as because this is something that artists don't really think about such things i mean i'm sure some do but i certainly never thought about the idea of a lead magnet and so first of all i just maybe you could just kind of tell us about what it is how i use it and i'll just say the why i asked because i just remember that when I started with Hype Fury and I signed up to the sort of inspiration one per day, and I think it's like 100 days or something, and every single day you get an email from Hype Fury uh, inspiring you about content generation. And it's just an amazing, it, it's an amazing course. And what I was really shocked about was I opened every single one because I was always curious about the sort of education that you were doing. So it's a massive gift to your people, but also the most amazing sort of lead magnet, if you like. So I just wanted to kind of find yeah. out your, about your thoughts. It's funny. It actually has like a 60% open rate all, all, Crazy. all through the uh, 90 days, which is pretty good. Crazy. Yeah. So a lead magnet, like for artists, it's a little bit harder, but uh, what you could think of is like, okay, if you're releasing an, a new song, you could maybe release a small part of that song mm-hmm. or maybe a couple of tracks you use or something that's interesting to people that are following you, that are fans. You say, mm-hmm. well, hey, I've got this for free. I'm, uh, I haven't lo- uh, released my new thing yet. Um, if you want it before everybody else, um, you know, you can download it here. Just give me your email. And uh, that's a fair, fair trade. That's basically what we do as well. We have, I don't know, probably a dozen or so different lead magnets, uh, all for different types of people. For example, like a 90-day free uh, course to really uh, give you inspiration every day. But we have like other email courses. We have uh, e-books and other, other downloads. And these are just ways of us, you know, capturing our own audience uh, because mm-hmm. we're renting something on Twitter or on Instagram, but you actually want to be able to reach out to your own fans when you want it and not when the algorithm mm-hmm. decides, you know, to show your post. And that's just a great way. So we've built like a, an audience of, uh, I think, 40,000 emails over, over the course of uh, a little while. Yeah. And it's a great way for us to reach, reach people. I mean, that is just so powerful and 
it's so effective. I mean, it's interesting because I've been looking into lead magnets and developing my own online courses this year. And funny enough, I've just got sucked into a documentary, which is basically going to take the rest of the year. And I've got an album coming out and it's like, I just, I cannot get to it, but I'm learning so much. It's a okay. wonderful education. I mean, just also just, it's something sort of for artists to think about because often when an artist is, let's say, releasing an album, it's like, you're thinking, how do you get it out to people? How do you get it into them, into their heads? How can they hear the song and the rest of it? And what I find lovely about the, the sort of concept of a lead magnet is it's the invitation in. I'm providing yep. you with something wonderful. And I mean, look at that. You've got, first of all, 40 thousand people that you've brought in which is an extraordinary uh, i mean people talk about this this idea i mean i don't like the idea of ownership but the, but it's good as a metaphor that you, you ne you'd never ha have the fan with you when you're actually on the social media it's sort of essentially you're renting your audience whereas when you've got the email or whatever then you've got that direct contact with yeah. fans and so when you started hype fury did you immediately start with that as a strategy or did it come later how did that develop as a sort of one of the sort of pincers of your funnel or however you describe it yeah we did that pretty early on i think uh probably in the, in the first couple of months i think you know, it's just, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it started, but like we use Gumroad for a lot of things. And why do we use yeah. Gumroad? Because a lot of other people also use Gumroad. And if mm -hmm. somebody downloads one of our lead magnets, they only have to click, I want this, and then they get the download, but we also get their email. Yeah. You know, and in, in the in the fine print, we also say, of course, that they'll be sharing their mm -hmm. email with us. They'll receive emails from us. And so it's like literally with one click, we'll get somebody's email. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, you know, this is our, our top three uh, channel, you know, for, for, for getting customers. It's, it's great. And, and we have like literally dozens of automation set up, you know, if somebody's done with our onboarding, they'll get different emails. If they um, do something or don't do something in our app, they have emails. And so we have really customer based emails, mm -hmm. but then we also have emails based on what people have downloaded, what type of um, lead gen they've downloaded. So we've, like dozens of, uh, of automations. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yannick. I'm struggling to get my first and now my head has exploded. And that is that. <laughs> no, it's really, it's, it's so inspiring. And I, I find it exciting to look at it from a different angle because I think a lot of artists sort of feel stuck and feel like, oh, it's, if you don't have a sort of a bigger player or some outside funding coming in, whether it's from a, whoever from a record label or if you're a designer, if you don't have a bigger client like Nike or whoever, there's this sense of how the hell can I ever progress or whatever and what I'm really enjoying about learning from the business community is it's just about how do you get back to that sort of that hustle culture and what are the tools that you can use and what are the tools that the business community use in order to build things and I just love that sort of very much that sort of can do attitude of really utilizing this the potential of the online culture and the fact that everyone's online nowadays and I also found it very interesting i believe that you have a whole a sort of something like a hundred different side hustle projects or websites that are sort of continually bringing you in sort of passive income that require minimal management now did i dream that or is that true no no you didn't dream that yeah <laughs> that, that's true that's true and so i i started with that i think 15 years ago or wow. something maybe a little bit less mm -hmm. like but my first job i hated that i was at a big bank here in the netherlands then my second job i got recruited into a digital agency mm -hmm. and like literally everybody had a side project <laughs> and so i think after two weeks or so i started my own side mm -hmm. project create a website and it started ranking in google i think i made i don't know a dollar or something or a euro back then mm -hmm. um in the first month and then 10 in the second month and then it scaled to literally thousands of euros amazing uh, every month yeah and then i was you know after two years i quit that job i started freelancing and then with a part of my revenue i started buying new websites so i didn't uh, create them from scratch anymore i just bought you know, existing projects. And that's, that's how I accumulated like a lot of different websites. Oh. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. It's the opportunity that is out there. If you're, if you're willing to 
engage with it nowadays. And something that I really enjoy about that story is it's just the can do mentality. Because again, it's like you're not talking like all of those those different projects. I mean, I, I maybe there were some you were ambitious with, but it sounds like you were collecting a portfolio, a bit like people invest in the stock market, creating a portfolio, lots of passive income coming in there and go, okay, this is something I can give a little bit of value here, here, and here. There's minimum, min, minimal management. And I can set up enough money coming in that I can really get on with my passion project. Yeah. I also made a lot of mistakes there. Like I also, I like I had a, had a, a web shop with uh, hair care products. I didn't do uh -huh. any of the shipping, but like that was, that was a disaster. I, uh, I sold like um, everything that had to do with physical products was a complete failure. So I bought a couple of those stores. I thought, well, I can, I know SEO, I know uh, um, um, conversion optimization. I can like 10, 10 X scale this business easily, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but somehow that, that was not the case. And so like, it's really hard to do physical products. So I, I, mm -hmm. I learned my lesson. I, 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 bought a couple of those projects, but never again. Well, it's, it's something that I really enjoyed about spending time more in the business community and with bootstrappers, hackers, people who are building stuff online, is that they've kind of, it feels like there's a very high, <laughs> a very high pain threshold in that it's like, okay, this isn't working for these two weeks. I'm flipping over onto this one and I'm going to give this one six months. But it's a kind of, it's a very kind of blood in tooth and claw approach and sort of mentality. And it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And if it doesn't work, I'm just going to pivot onto the next. Now, is that fair or were there some of the projects where it hurt like hell? Well, some of the projects hurt like hell, but I think generally speaking i think it's good to look at a project and if it's if if there's no movement within a certain period of time uh, probably two weeks might be a bit too short but uh, some people spend years building a product never talking about it never mm -hmm. sharing it with anybody right. and then once they release it it's you know it's utter crap nobody wants it and so there's like a big difference between spending two weeks on it and then abandoning it or yep. spending two years on it and mm -hmm. i think you can even in a day, you can come up with an idea validated by messaging people saying, hey, I've got mm -hmm. this. Do you want to pay money for it? And yeah, that you can validate an idea with, with zero upfront cost. You can say, well, mm -hmm. pay me upfront and I'll create it instead of, you know, building things and, and thinking your idea is great, but you never know until you get paid for it. So there is this sort of philosophical spirit of unattachment within it. And when an artist is creating something very much, there's a sort of reading of self and experience worldview, and there's a massive personal and spiritual identification with that thing that they're making. So I've noticed, I mean, of course, when people are building things, building their sites and online and making SaaS companies and the rest of it, of course, people also care in, in different ways. But I've just, it's something I'm feeding and taking from the sort of build in public area and online community is to try and find in my own work a sweet spot between still having that passion and making the effort to put the belief and the spirituality and the artistry and the thought and all the rest of it into what it is that I'm making. But then getting more into a spirit of shipping it and saying, right, I'm going to get this made and then I'm going to move on. And I've been thinking about it really rather a lot because I think about, say, the Beatles in the early days. They were learning, learning, learning. And there was such a pressure from the record company that they just had to get to it. They had to find the limit of their potential. And the thing was, they were never clogging up their arteries with the things that they've made before. And I think in the arts, we're often hoarding stuff to such a high degree. And I'm certainly guilty of this. So it's more just a, a reflection, less of a question, Yannick, that I find that something I'm very grateful for from learning from all you lunatics on the, the SAS side. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a different vibe. But I think like you're you're right with the Beatles, but also I think Beyonce, she also released I don't right. know hundred hundred songs and only a couple were really big. So R Rihanna, I mean she's the work ethic. So yeah. that's just something to think about. And I think the the over attachment is often the thing that stops you putting it out because it takes forever to make and you're always trying to improve it. And then suddenly life changes a bit and it's like, oh, wow, we're making this project and it, it felt really good for then. And I know I've got to put it out, but it doesn't feel quite right now for this moment in time, but I can't do anything new yeah. until I get it out. So you're kind of very easy to get caught in this kind of quagmire. Yeah.
You should still release it, yeah. A hundred percent. Well, that's the thing. That's what I love about this sort of building public uh, sort of spirit. It's it's just to get unattached to it and also to get more into the process of doing stuff. And of course, you're encouraging people with hype fury to, to do that. It's like access your mind, see what's in there, put it out, let tomorrow be huh? a new day. Uh, and I find that really exciting. So was it always your your dream to to be a builder? Or do you think it was something that the fates brought you to? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I, I've only been employed for less than three years in, of my life. Um, and, and after that, I, I started freelancing at like big corporates in the Netherlands, financial institutions, like um, internet providers. And they were literally, they were, you know, throwing money away. Like it was, it was like, it's pretty sad, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I was the one spending it, but I was, I was also the person that said, you know, can't we do a little bit less? But they were just, it was some sort of spending free uh, frenzy. I, I made a lot of money. I enjoyed my time. I, I you know, I, I drove cool cars. I got my driver of uh, my pilot license. I uh, wow. did a lot of cool stuff. Um, but uh, after a while, I just I just didn't feel it anymore, and that's when I, you know, knew I I need to stop doing this. I need to build my own mm -hmm. thing, and so um, I, I got together with a couple other people, and we co-founded uh, something like Uber for service professionals here in the mm -hmm. Netherlands. So if you had like I don't know your central heating was so uh, was broken, you could um, send uh, like post your job, and within thirty minutes you'd have somebody over. Uh, mm -hmm in your house fixing your uh, heating um I, I scaled that to like three million ar i really enjoyed that that ride it was fantastic um and and yeah after that i, I sold my shares i started freelancing again just to you know have something to do but mm -hmm. i i knew that i wouldn't um keep doing that and so mm -hmm. when i stumbled upon this i actually i didn't f um found high fury uh, sammy was, did sammy he, right yeah yeah, yeah, and he actually he posted a, a message on the Indie Hackers forum saying, "Hey, I'm looking for a marketing co-founder." I reached out. I flew to Paris for the weekend, and then I, I worked for free for two months uh, mm -hmm. to show him that I could also walk the walk mm -hmm. uh, and talk the talk. Um, and yeah, the, we 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 ended up co-founding the business together. So yeah, I I I, I really. I like this vibe, just mm -hmm. being my own boss, uh, having having the freedom of you know deciding what to do and when mm -hmm. to do it. It's that's that's something that suits me a lot. Do you work from home or do you have an office that you will go to? Yeah, so I'm now at the office, which is like a, it's a 15 minute bike ride from where mm -hmm. we live. So in the morning, I drop off the kids, and then it's another like eight minutes to to the office, and it's just it's just more quiet. And actually, I rent it together with my girlfriend. Uh, she has like a, a web shop so mm -hmm. all her like her stock is here and i just i just have my little spot here with my yeah. screen and my 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 setup that's it yep. uh, and what's your sort of like your your daily routine i'm very interested in how founders manage their energy and i mean obviously you've built this fantastic product and it's doing so well and there's so much interest but also of course pressure comes with that and responsibility and you're having to upkeep it and all the rest of it. So just, yeah, how do you manage your energy? What's your process with that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I bike about like 100 miles a week. Mm -hmm. and so I, I'm pretty big in sports. I go to the gym three, four times a week. I do field hockey. Before, do you do um, that be before work or during work? What's cause... During work. So b biking is, of course, to and from um here so that's a lot of the biking and then also to other places but mm -hmm. primarily that's just um to work and then during work usually around 10 11 ish i go to the gym every day except for friday and and, and weekends so, so just, Monday just to ask, Thursday. so just to ask you why 10 o'clock the reason that i ask is is it because you would be feeling your first dip coming in at that time or is there is there any reason why it's a 10 o'clock gym yeah, so I do intermittent fasting, and mm -hmm. so I don't I don't eat breakfast, and then usually around twelve ish, I eat my first meal, um, and so for me it's good to still be um, um, 
you know, in my fast, um, burning a bit more fat. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I also find it more enjoyable to, uh, to work out on an empty stomach. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Like, and then Mondays are usually a bit more filled with meetings. Mm -hmm. And so we have like product meetings where we talk about the product, what we're going to build, how we're going to build it, Mm -hmm. what we're going to build first team meeting with the marketing team. And then Tuesday today is like more my production day. So I've done another podcast earlier today and it's more, uh, yeah, getting things done day. Uh And Wednesday is more a bit more like uh, reflection, like more high level. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? And then uh, Thursdays depends. And Fridays is again more a bit, bit more meetings. Again, uh, mm-hmm. a couple more product meetings, stuff like that. So there's a loose degree of systematization to your week. Yep. And like yeah, and it's it, same every week. Yeah. Same every week. And at what point do you flag? Like, do you have a certain time in the day where your energy goes down, or are you pretty consistent with your energy, or do you take a siesta? Like, what what are your what's your approach? Pretty pretty consistent. I just I yep. usually leave around five ish. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a bit earlier. And on, on a Friday, I mm-hmm. uh, work for half a day. I pick uh-huh. up my my kids at school, and mm-hmm. I. I take oh, some nice. sports, stuff like yeah, that. Lovely, yeah. lovely. Just another question. So I, I'm a fan of Cal Newport and his approach. And something that I find interesting with entrepreneurs is just about the approach to task management and particularly with deep work. So um, something that Cal New, Newport talks about is the danger of context shifting. So you're going from one thing to the next and he has a sort of private war against distraction and diluting your focus. And yet often with entrepreneurs who are whether several different companies or dealing with so many different things all concurrently at the same time, it's very easy for the to be this sort of dilution of attention. And I'm just wondering if you have a process of deep work, whether you're programming or you're doing this thing, if there, is there a certain amount of time you dive in? Just, yeah, what's your sort of approach to going hardcore yeah. at a task? Yeah. I read this book, Deep Work. It's good. Um, so there's not really for me. Uh, I do. Mm. I mostly do the deep work on Tuesday where I go a bit more deeper into like really diving into things. Um, but usually like no more than, than two, three hours. And then I'm, I'm pretty much done for the day for like mm-hmm. really like production work. Right. And because that's and when I first started High Fury, I was doing production work all day. You know, it was uh-huh. just me and Sammy mm-hmm. and he was, he was coding and I was, I don't know, writing blogs, writing emails, mm-hmm. uh, writing tweets, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and these days I do a lot less of that. I try mm-hmm. to do Tuesdays um, to still do a little bit of, I, I still enjoy it. So I, I still yep. do that, but like mostly it's my team and I have to, you know, figure out how to help them, um, how to remove roadblocks and mm-hmm. what to do next and, and manage them. So it's, it's different. It's, 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 you know, not really deep work anymore for me. Right. Well, th- thank you for that overview. What are the challenges for Hype Fury since since it became X or since uh, Elon Musk took it over? Yeah. So a couple of months ago, now five months ago or so, they um, started charging for API access. Before we like, hardly paid anything, mm-hmm. and now we pay forty two k a month, uh, which for- is wow. A- Yes, four two with three zeros. Whoa! Yeah, so that's like uh, I would say a, a decent house every year. We, is that is that uh, is that re- is, is is that relative to the amount of income that you're bringing in, or is that just the price of doing it? It's just the price. That's the minimum. The minimum fee for enterprise access, and any 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 business like ours. Has to pay forty two k. Like you can't. You, there's now a plan for five k and for two k, mm-hmm. but literally we couldn't do anything with it. So we need this plan. Yeah. Wow. So, if, so if this would have happened, like I don't know, uh, eighteen months ago or so, we 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 probably co- couldn't afford it. You know. So yeah. I mean, it's, it's also it's... yeah. It, it it happened also. Yeah. So we could afford it. But the entire landscape changed of Twitter tools because there were many many small Twitter tools. They just disappeared and mm-hmm. we had the, the the luck that we could acquire a couple and we acquired four um four indie projes really um, such as black yeah, magic black magic yeah 
and mm. inbox and high vue and then yeah. another thing yeah and so is, is your ship steadying? Because that, I mean, that, I was like, I had no idea you were talking about that type of fees. I mean, that's, that's a sort of, I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's a potential enterprise killer. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, so, you know, if it happened 18 months earlier, we would have been in big trouble. We would have to mm. fire everybody and just uh, eat uh, dry bread all day. Um, and now, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're still like, comfortable of course like our our profit margins have dropped because of you know that mm -hmm. high fee but you know we're still we're still growing mm -hmm. we're a healthy business mm -hmm. um yeah but we, we you know we had to change quite a few things mm -hmm. because like we were doing like it's a bit of a technical thing but we were you know doing a lot of requests to twitter servers mm -hmm. uh, black magic our tool we acquired was doing a lot of and we had to like minimize that because you know you pay per request and you know we didn't want to go to the next mm -hmm. enterprise level which was 125k a month you know that would yeah uh, that was a bit too much uh, for our appetite uh, <laughs> yeah uh, we, we didn't want to mm -hmm. uh, spend that, that type of money. So we had to change a lot of things under the hood. Um, and now, yeah, Twitter is making other changes. So we have to do, you know, a lot of other technical stuff I'm mm -hmm. not going to bore you with. But it has an impact in the sense <laughs> that, you know, we have to spend time on that and not yeah. spend time on improving our product for our users. And I suspect not just time, but that must be also a lot more energy. I mean, this is so much you have to be sort of keeping up to date with and adapting to. Yeah, true, true. It's uh, I think it's also a good thing. Like they're making a lot of positive mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. We're seeing you know uh, a lot more people coming to Twitter, which is a good thing. Oh, on the other side, yeah, yeah, we are definitely. Yeah. yeah, but but on the other side, like they haven't been really forthcoming and making improvements on the API. So the mm -hmm. we uh, so we we talk through you know some kind of system with the computers of of, of Twitter. And that system, they haven't really upgraded that yet since Elon took over. And then, so we're waiting actually for like like long form posts. A lot of people want long form posts on mm -hmm. Hive Fury, but we just we can't support it yet. Why? Because the API doesn't support it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there are a lot of those things we're waiting for. And so yeah, it's just. Um, so it's interesting that people are coming on to Twitter to your perspective. So what's your perspective of threads and do you think it's going to last? Well, just give me your, your gut instinct with it. Yeah, well, it, it'll, it'll last in the sense that, you know, a lot of big creators will probably stay there. It's just, it's easy to copy and paste your post to threads. Mm -hmm. it's, it's simple, but, but like the, the, the number of, of, of daily active users has plummeted really and Conti i think in like in the first sorry so is it continuing to do so yeah 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 mm -hmm. it is and mm -hmm. and like i think in the first week it launched like i think we got maybe 100 requests of hey when are you going to integrate threads are you going to integrate when is it coming and right now like in the past month like zero and so mm -hmm. yeah i i, I it, it might pick up, but I don't think it will. And, would, it and be so, worth, would it be worth to build it into Hype Fury as a plan to do that on the off chance that it does sustain itself? Or do you just don't see it as a worthwhile bet at this point? Yeah, no, it has to sustain itself first before mm -hmm. we do that. Because we, we'd much rather prefer to integrate with YouTube and TikTok before threads because, mm -hmm. you know, they have such a large user base compared to threads. So w will you integrate with YouTube? We will, yeah, we will. Come on, give give us give give us a sign. When do you think that might happen? Uh, yeah, it, it'll probably take take a take a while, months, yeah. I would say, yeah. because we're we're doing other things first. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it'll take a couple months, and then you know, once you post a video, we'll create like a snippet out of that. You can share it on Twitter yeah. or somewhere else. Cool. Um, That's exciting. I, I'd love that that functionality. Brilliant. Um, so so look, um, I I. Did a shout out having you on on Twitter and was uh, actually a really cool reaction. So is it cool to blast through a few questions before we go? Definitely. So I've got Definitely. some questions from the guys and girls and ladies on um and, uh, on, on on Twitter, and I've got then a final question from myself. So um here we go. So Anton asks, "What was your approach from idea to product market fit?" 
Yep. Yeah. And so th- this is Sammy talking right now because Sammy um, <laughs> uh, actually created High Fury. He was in a couple of paid communities, uh, fitness and sales, and all those people were also on Twitter. And you know they they so they spoke about it a lot. One of them said like, "Hey, why isn't there a tool that lets you schedule threads?" Well, Sammy also thought the same. Why isn't there? You you asked that question on uh, on Twitter as well, and there were literally no tools. Like even Buffer, which was around for for years back then, didn't have that. And so when 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 he realized there was no tool, he started building it. And so. In three or four days, he built like an MVP, which is a minimal viral product, like a, a, literally a, a basic functionality mm-hmm. of your tool so you can test if it's you know a viable product. Uh, he built it. He shared it in those communities. People loved it. And mm-hmm. then he started a private beta. So with that, you can create a little bit of scarcity, like say, hey, I'm only going to admit 50 people. So then people want to join because they think, hey, something is scarce. Um, and then he just listened very well to those users say, okay, what do you want to build? What, what should mm-hmm. I add? And, mm-hmm. you know, he kept listening to them mm-hmm. for a long time. And, and quickly after he started, he, he added a payment option. They started paying and he knew he was onto something. Wow. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. So Brinda asks, what's your favorite book? And if you have a mentor. Yeah, I do have a mentor. Uh, he's actually somebody I, I worked for. He was my my boss uh, at one of the um, big corporates I worked for. He's a, he's a great guy. I I don't know what else to tell you about him, but yeah, um, yeah I do. And and look, uh, I think a lot of people are looking for mentors, uh, but there are not really a lot of mentors that are available or have time to mentor you. And so what I would always do is like if you want to be mentored by someone. Uh, be their permissionless apprentice Mm -hmm. and you know think about okay what does this person need or want in his life can i do something for this person Mm -hmm. um that's a great way of just showing them that you know you're there and Mm -hmm. things then might take off you could become their mentee um Mm -hmm. this is this is one of the books I, I love. I, I have more. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit sunburned. Mm-hmm. Um, it's by Byron Sharp, uh, How Brands Grow. And it's it's not really for artists, I would say, but for marketers, it's great mm-hmm. uh, because it has a lot of insights on, on, you know, how to literally grow a brand. So it was really insightful for me. Great. Well, thanks for the tip. I mean, I think one of the things I'm learning at the moment is just is that you you to keep as open as possible to everything, especially outside your own genre or sphere, because there's just so many different ways to learn nowadays. So ask Arno, I know you've covered this, but Arno's asking what's on your roadmap for Hype Fury. Yeah, yeah. So we don't share everything we're, we're building, but um, we're creating an integration with LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, we already, you can already post to LinkedIn, but more like the login system, which, you know, takes a, a lot of time to, to build, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, what else um, can I share? Uh, well, I, I, I spoke about like YouTube and TikTok. Those are things we'll share. And, and we're going to like, you know, do some things where people can, can test a bit more. Mm-hmm. I won't say more, but I think that's, uh, that's enough for people who know what we're doing. We'll be watching that space. So just a couple more. So um, Mr. Bushido asks, what are your thoughts on the future of X? Yeah, I think it's bright. Like, you know, I, I Elon is a, is a, you know, he doesn't care about optics. So I think the way he does things isn't always correct. But I think the general direction is great. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I see a very bright future for X. And just following on from that, Pia asked, what opportunities do you see in the changing landscape? Are there particular opportunities there? What, yeah, what... video, definitely video. Video. Uh, yeah, you, you see like there's, there's on TikTok, if you post something and it's good, you'll, you'll get a lot of eyeballs. You, don't, you'll need, you need zero followers mm-hmm. and you can still get a lot of eyeballs. And the same thing is going to happen on Twitter is mm-hmm. my prediction. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's already a little bit of a discoverability uh, feature for video, but I think it's going to be uh, approved a lot over mm-hmm. the course of uh, the next few months. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. And I take it that would be native posting rather than link yeah. posting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Venius asks, um, how does automation affect the authenticity of messages? Yeah, so so I think, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, I think a year or so, less than a year. Uh, if you clicked on a post, you would see um, through what type of app it was actually posted. Mm-hmm. So you could see Hype Fury or Twitter for iPhone or, you know. And there, I think a lot of people, you know, they had a certain feeling uh, towards a scheduled post. These days, that's gone. So nobody knows if it's scheduled or not, if something is automated mm-hmm. or not. So, you know, I wouldn't be scared at all. That's a, that's a great in, insight and a, a good reason to use Hype Fury. Again, Yannick is not paying me for this, <laughs> but I'm just a fan. <laughs> what can I say, man? You know, that's why I wanted to speak with you. So final question here from one of the people before one last of mine. So Zach asks, What's your number one tip for reducing noise and making your Twitter stroke X experience more enjoyable? Yeah, um, I would say mute the right uh, words. You can mute words. That helps. Mm -hmm. Um, Follow the right people and, Mm -hmm. you know, stay on the um, following tab instead of the for you tab, which is a bit more like, you know, mm-hmm. you can get a lot of different things there. But if you follow the right people and you just stay on the uh, following tab, then, you know, that's all the filtering you need, I think. Lovely, Yannick. So look, just a last little area. And I just wanted to, what I something that I really enjoy from what you put out, it's, it's not just to kind of get people on Hype Fury there's a real sort of motivational aspect. It feels like that that's a really important part of you to encourage people to develop their potential and to get stuck into the world. And I find that like really exciting in terms of uh, as a sort of leader, if you like. And so I just wondered if you maybe have some encouraging words for solopreneurs, for artists who are just starting out in their social media journey what would you say to them what's the opportunity why should they be doing it yeah so so why should you do it i think everybody or at least everybody i spoke to uh wants a bit more freedom in their life wants a bit more choice of how they gonna you know fill up their calendar or not and i think you know building an audience is a great way of 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 doing that Mm -hmm. and yeah i think a lot of people hesitate at the beginning. They think, what should, what can I share? What are people interested in? But you've got to remember, at the beginning of your journey, you'll have zero followers. So nobody will actually see the stuff you share. So just think about it as you're taking notes for yourself. Uh, you're just documenting your own journey. Uh, maybe just for, for your kids or, or, or your mom or whatever. Um, and during your own journey, you'll start to see that people will be attracted to what you're doing and you'll start seeing okay this resonates more with people than that okay i should talk more about that or i should share more things about that and yeah i think it, it's very hard to get started it's very hard to get your first 100 or 1000 followers so keep at it don't focus on the on the on the numbers um and think about think think um think about uh, building an audience not as I want to get likes and comments and then and repost, whatever. Think about it more as every time you shared something, that's the point you already learned something. And all the rest is extra. The likes you're getting, the, the comments you're getting, that's extra. Yannick, thank you so much for get, coming on this lovely conversation, packing it with value, but also personality and good vibes and encouragement for people. You're very welcome. The only thing is, I I, I thought one day I would get a podcast that was under an hour. We were so close, but that (laughs) that trophy's still out of there. It didn't happen again. (laughs) But um, yeah, thanks again, man. And wishing you a beautiful evening and week ahead. You're welcome, man. Thanks, Jim. Have a great day. You too, man. Bye-bye.